Hi there, and thanks for tuning in. This is Algebra 1, Chapter 3, Test Review, and we're just looking at that test review packet that you got in class. For number one, this one would not be a function, because if you look right here, there are two different x inputs, and whenever you have two x inputs, it cannot pass the vertical line test, okay? For number two, that one is a function, and then the function is nonlinear. Let me explain why that is nonlinear. Because the directions say determine whether the function is linear or nonlinear if it is a function. Here we are. We have each input, one input, one output. But the numbers up here go up by twos. But down here we have plus zero, plus four, plus six, plus two. So this one, it's not linear because there's no constant rate of change. Down here for number three, this could be a function, and it will actually be linear because you can actually rewrite this one as y is equal to mx plus b. So let me show you how that works. We would just subtract two from each side. So we would get negative five y equals negative two x plus 10, and then divide each side or everything by negative five and you get y is equal to 2 fifths x minus 2. So that would be a linear function. The last one in number 4 is also a function, and it is linear because if you graph this one, y equals 3 looks like this, and that can pass the vertical line test, B L T. Okay, so there are your answers for one through four. Number five, this domain um, is a continuous, we'll go ahead and call it continuous and then we'll find domain ranges. So continuous for the domain, and then it says find domain range for each. So the domain here is negative two, would be less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to positive two. And then the range can be anywhere from zero all the way up to 4. So 0 is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 4. For number 6, this domain is discrete, because we have points here. Um, the domain inputs, we can have negative 3, negative 1, 0, and 1. And there's also 3 right here too, just look closely. And then the ranges, we have a 0, we have a 2, and then we also have a 3 at the very top. Okay, so there are your answers for 5 and 6. For number 7, it says evaluate the function when you have negative 1, 0, and 4. So basically what you're doing is you're just plugging in each of those values. So negative 2 times negative 1 minus 4, negative 2 times 0 minus 4, and negative 2 times 4 minus 4. When I start to solve these, the first one I got 2 minus 4, which is equal to negative 2. The next one when I have 0, that one's going to be 0 minus 4, which is equal to negative 4. And then the next one I'll have negative 8 minus 4, which is equal to negative 12. Sorry about that, Bill. Um, the next one we're plugging in still negative 1, 0, and 4, but we have absolute value. So our answers all should be positive here. You did need to be careful with the first one because a negative negative one is just going to give you a positive one. And so you're basically just doing one plus five, which is equal to six. So the absolute value of six is six. For here, we're basically just doing negative zero plus five or zero plus five, and that's going to give us five. And then the last one, we get a one, which is equal to one. For number nine, it says find the value of x so that g of x is equal to negative 16. So what we're going to do is just plug in negative 16 where g of x is and then solve for x. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 8 from both sides. These two 8's cancel out. Negative 16 and a negative 8, that is going to give me a negative 24. So I have negative 24 is equal to negative 4x, and then I'm just going to divide both sides by negative 4 so that x is equal to 6. Okay. For number 10, the points represented are represented by the table that lie on a line, so find the slope. Remember, we can find the slope by doing y2 minus y1, or the change in y, 
over x2 minus x1 for the change in x. So I just am going to do 4 minus 7, and I'll do the same thing here, 3 minus negative 5. 4 minus 7 gives me a negative 3, and 3 minus negative 5 gives me an 8. If I did switch those around, I just forgot to put my negative 3 there, so negative 3 plus 5 will give me a 2. So my slope would be negative 3 over 2. For number 11 and 12, you're just trying to find the x and y intercepts. Sorry about that bell. So what we're basically doing to find the x-intercept is replacing y is equal to 0. So negative 3x plus 5 parentheses 0 is equal to negative 30. And then solving, so that's basically negative 3x is equal to negative 30, or x is equal to 10. The y-intercept, you just do the opposite. So you're basically crossing off the x's. So for the y-intercept, 5y is equal to negative 30. That means your y-intercept is equal to negative 6. So you can also rewrite these as 10 comma 0 and 0 comma negative 6. Over here, same thing. Let's go ahead and fill in um, y for 0. So that would be 1 half x is equal to negative 8. And then we'll multiply each side by the reciprocal. So once we multiply both sides by 2, we get x is equal to negative 16. So that's your x-intercept. And then your y-intercept, you're just replacing that you're replacing x with 0, so basically crossing out the x's, so y is automatically given to us. y is equal to negative 8. And again, those intercept points can be negative 16 comma 0 and 0 comma negative 8. Uh, for 13 and 14, you're basically plugging in um, these for your cost in dollars for m months. So what I'm essentially going to do is just write down my problem first. c is equal to 29m plus 54.5, and it says how many months of cable can be made for if you have $344.50. So you're basically just replacing C with 344.5, and then equals 29M plus 54.50. First, going to subtract both sides by 54.50, or 54.5, and that's going to give me 290 is equal to 29M. And then there, you're just going to divide both sides by 29, so M is equal to 10. So that would be 10 months. For number four, you're kind of doing the switch of that. What would be the cost of cable service for six months? So now you're finding the cost and just plugging in 29 times 6, or 29M, plus the 54.5. That's going to give you 174, or 29 times 6, plus 54.5, which is equal to 228. So we would say $228.50. For number 15, you are just basically trying to write an equation here to represent the situation and then also try to find the independent and the dependent variables. So your cost would be equals 22 tickets and B represents the number of basketball tickets. So 22B would have to be going together and then plus the $4.50 handling fee because that is going to be given to you no matter what or no matter how many tickets that you buy. Your independent variable would need to be B, the number of tickets, but your dependent variable would be the C. So just remember your independent is always your input. It's an easy way to remember because they both start with I's and your dependent variable is always the output because it doesn't start with an I essentially. For number 16, you're finding the slope of each line. So remember that is rise over run. And what I normally do is I just start with the leftmost point and then figure out how much do I need to rise and how much do I need to run. So I need to rise down 2 and then run 2. So that's minus 2 for negative and positive 2 for a run. That's going to simplify to be a negative 1 slope. For number 17, though, I'm starting down here. I have to rise 1, 2, 3, and run 1, 2. And that one's a positive, so I'll have positive 3 over 2 for my slope. For number 18, to graph the linear equation, what I did is I got y by itself to put it in slope-intercept form. So I subtracted my x's from both sides first. So I get negative 3y is equal to negative x plus 6. 
And then you're going to need to divide everything by negative 3, which means y is equal to positive 1 third x minus 2. So the minus 2 is your y-intercept. So I'm going to go down here on my y-axis and find negative 2. And then your 1 third, remember, is your slope, which is rise over run. So I'm going to rise 1 and run 3. So rise 1, 1, 2, 3, run. Rise 1, 1, 2, 3, run. And I'm just going to erase my tracks here so you can see the process of how I got there. And then connect my points. So this one's not a really steep slope because it's a small fraction. Number 19 is already in slope-intercept form, so I don't have to rewrite anything for that one. My y-intercept is positive 1. And then my slope is negative 2 over 3. So that means I'm going to fall 2, negative 2, and then run 3. 1, 2, 3. Same thing. Down 2, over 3. Okay. And then again, I'm just going to erase my tracks here and connect my points. Okay. For 20A and 20B, these are multiple choice, and they will be multiple choice on your um, test. But remember, this one is where you're looking at vertex, the vertex um, equation. And basically in 20A, you're looking at H, which is your horizontal shift. And kind of how you remembered it is if you shift to the left one, you're going to be looking for a positive one um, because it would technically be the opposite. So we would have to make it be a negative one to be able to equal to zero. So that one we are going to choose A as our option. These C's and D's cannot be the option because they are representing K. And in 20A, we're seeing a horizontal shift which represents H. And it would not be minus 1 because minus 1 would actually shift it to the right. So A is our best choice for that one. For 20B, though, that is a K translation. And notice it's gone up 6. So we do need to choose C for that one. The first two, A and B, are talking about H. And letter D talks about K, but it's a negative 6 translation. And we did not move down. We moved up. The last little bit of our packet, we are just matching which ones are negative, positive, undefined, and zero. So the negative slope is slope B right here. The positive slope is slope A. The undefined slope is slope D. And then the zero slope is slope C. Remember with zero slope, that's having like zero incline and you want to kind of maybe think about the treadmill there when you are on a treadmill and you have zero incline you're walking on a nice um, level incline there so think about that whereas undefined you can't walk on a treadmill when it's up and down like this for number 23 we're talking about um, making a function for the transformations it says the graph g of x with the absolute value of x is translated four units to the right and then one down well i know one down is going to be the minus one outside of the absolute value it hasn't been stretched or um, shrunk, so I can go ahead and write my g of x. I'm basically just concerned with x something and then 4 units to the right. Since it does say 4 units to the right, I need to show x is minus 4, because that's the opposite of the positive 4. Or think about if I wanted to shift 4 units to the right, I would have to put a 4 minus 4 to make that happen. So here's my answer. g of x is equal to the absolute value of x minus 4 minus 1. For 24, we're just going to describe the transformation that's happening here. The only transformation that we see in number 24 is this negative 2. And so that would be a stretch because a is bigger than 1. And it's going to be towards the y-axis by a factor of 2 and so I should raise my period there it opens downward because it's negative so you needed to have both of those things done there if you wrote shrink it would be incorrect shrinks are for your smaller um, numbers so when a is in between a 0 and a 1, or a fraction.
Okay, so just make sure you keep that in mind. Maybe you want to review your study sheet for number 24 as well. The last one, you're just graphing um, g of x with the vert with you have, and you have a negative x minus, and then absolute value of minus 2 plus 3. I do know that I am going up 3, translating 1, 2, 3, and it is a part of the parent function. Um, my, so then I also know that I need to be moving to the right too, so 1, 2. So my vertex, or my turning point, would be positive 2, comma 3. And notice I do have a negative in front of here, so that technically is, can also represent your slope if you haven't noticed that yet. The slope is negative 1, 1, so you would essentially be just moving downward with each of your points here. And again, it is a replica of the parent function. It hasn't been stretched or shrunk, so we didn't need to actually make an x and y table for that. If you wanted to, you can still make an x and y table. I would just make sure you got far enough so that you could have gotten to 2, to two comma 3, because right here, that would be considered your vertex. So you would want to plug in 1, 0, and then a 3 and a 4. Again, apologies about the bell. Um, so when you plug in a 0, you would get 0 minus 2, that's absolute value of 2, but then negative 2 plus 3 would give you a 1. When you plug in your 1, you get answer to 2. When you plug in a 3, you get the answer of 2, and when you plug in a 4, you get the answer of 1. Okay? That is going to conclude your Chapter 3 review. Thanks so much for tuning in, and good luck on your Chapter 3 test.